Okay, welcome to Tayana Wants to Know. Today we are with... Brian Stewart. That does... I'm the herpetologist at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and that means I'm a scientist who studies amphibians and reptiles. How many reptiles have you found so far? You mean help describe as new species to science? I guess it's more than 40 species of amphibians and reptiles at this point. What age was you when you wanted to do this? Oh, when I was just a little, little kid, I was always into animals. For me, it was always about animals. And um, at first, when I was really young, it was I was really into birds. And then eventually, as I got a little bit older, I sort of switched to amphibians and reptiles. But my whole life has always been about animals, as long as I can remember. What are you holding in your hands right now? So I'm holding two preserved scientific specimens of amphibians and reptiles. So that means they're, they're not alive. They've been preserved in originally in formalin and then in, in alcohol. Uh, and they're preserved so that they can stay like this indefinitely and scientists can continue to study them long into the future. And these are two examples that I've brought from Southeast Asia. So this is a specimen. It almost looks a little bit like a, a butterfly possibly from there. You don't like it? Look at this is a beautiful thing. Look at this. This is a flying lizard. <laughs> well, I'm gonna uh, all right. I'm gonna describe it. You don't have to look, but you have to listen. So these these lizards occur in Southeast Asia, and they climb high up on the trunks of trees, high up into the canopy of the forest, and then they can spread these processes uh, from their ribs, and the skin between them sort of forms like a parachute and they glide from one tree trunk to another. Oh, they can easily glide 30 feet. So when you're walking in the jungle in Southeast Asia, sometimes you'll be lucky if you look up and see a lizard glide from one tree to the next. One of the amazing things, there's so many gliding amphibians and reptiles in Southeast Asia. So I'm showing you an example of a, of a lizard. There's also a flying gecko. There's a snake that can glide from tree to tree. What's in your other hand? All right, so you tell me, what does that look like to you? You know this. A dead frog? Correct. This is a preserved specimen of frog from Southeast Asia. And this is a species that I described to science just last year. So when you, sometimes when you find new species, you can tell right away that it's something that looks very, very different from all other related species that are out there. But this was one where it looked just like this group of frogs looks like everywhere you go in Southeast Asia. Almost any stream in the forest in Southeast Asia will have one of some, um, you almost always find some of these brown frogs. But what happened was we brought some samples like this back here to the museum and we started measuring them and looking at them carefully under the microscope. We started sequencing their DNA. And what we realized was in different parts of Southeast Asia, there were the representative of this group of frog in that area was different in its external appearance and different genetically. And we realized that instead of there just being one of these species of brown frogs living on streams in the forest, we realized there are actually seven. And so we named five new species of science last year in this group of frogs, and this is one of them. This species of frog here, they live in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Where's that white stuff on the frog? White stuff on the frog? Yes, that. Oh, that's string. And the string is tied to, see that little tag with a number on it? So every research specimen in our collection has a unique number tied to it called a catalog number. And that number there is connected to our database and so can tell us exactly where that specimen was collected, who collected it, what the habitat was like, and all sorts of information. Because the, inf the data that go along with this specimen are just as important as the specimen itself. So we just had this specimen, this preserved specimen in a jar. Well, we might say, well, it looks different than other frogs but we wouldn't be able to do much more without knowing when and where it was collected. 
And so we use that number that's tied to the specimen to keep track of the data, the information that's associated with the frog permanently. Why did a frog have blue eyes like that? Why did it have blue eyes? Well, it's just kind of a, they have sort of that, 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 um, that thin eyelid is kind of a milky color and I guess in this light it kind of looks a little bit bluish but in life with the eye open this one would have kind of a reddish brown eyes mm -hmm. so that's just an artifact of the preservation well that's it for you guys thumbs up subscribe hit that bell button bye bye